Good. Okay. Thank you, thank you. So I thought I would start with a, um, a, uh, a comment I got on a grant application we made last year. Um, and uh, well, so I'm thinking, you know, so I was wondering why I got invited to this, uh, this, this, this thing about software correctness and reliability. And I guess I've been working on uh, hard real-time Java for many years and safety-critical safety Java. But um, I've moved recently and uh, I've been looking at scripting languages and that gives me a slightly different perspective. So, yes, I kind of agree with this reviewer. You know, this, that's a sad thing. I mean, he's not quite wrong. The part where he lost me was, then, why did they fund the grant? <laughs> All right. So, and I should, I should preface that while I'm part of SIGPLAN, the chair this year, this is not, uh, none of these opinions are endorsed by the special interest group on, pro on programming languages. These are just mine and mine alone. So, yes, JavaScript programmers hate you. You, me, yeah, pretty much everybody in this room, pretty much everybody who submits to Popol, pretty much everybody who writes a Greek letter in any of his papers. They, and for many years, I thought they merely ignored us or had contempt. But recently, since I've been working with them, I realized, no, it's actually active hate. They think we are evil and, you know, sort of a source of bad things. Well, that's kind of odd, right? Why, why is it? Well, fundamentally, it is because we believe in the orthodoxy and we pass it on. It's like a disease, right? You know, sort of. So what is the orthodoxy? The orthodoxy is, you know, the stuff that you get. So I grew up uh, learning from programming languages like Pascal and Modula, Oberon, you know, languages from here, Eiffel, all of these good things. And they tell you things like this. They tell you that programs have types. You know, that is, this is the natural thing. You know, if you can't type a program, well, try harder. You know, build a better type system. Okay? And then, you know, without any sort of, you know, sort of any uh, other, uh, other um, you know, backing uh, evidence, they will claim that type increase productivity. You know, if, the, if you put types in your program, you'll have fewer errors because there's a theorem that says that the program that is well typed doesn't go wrong. Uh, sorry? Well, this is the argument that we often make to our students. Now, we can argue we're wrong or right. I've heard it said many times. Types give you a documentation. That's it, machine, machine checks. Types let you write, uh, let your compiler generate better code. And in general, the uh, attitude that we seem to have, especially in academia, is static is better. Better than what? Well, just better. And, um, and also, that correctness is an end in itself. It's, this is the goal we're looking for, right? You know, we will do anything to prove that a program is correct, and that is the, you know, the object of a lot of our work. And, you know, all of this comes together in a package, and we're passing on that package to students. We're designing languages, we're designing tools, you know, build on these assumptions. But, so, you know, like I said, I worked on Java on real hard real-time systems for a while, where certainly, uh, you know, some degree of correctness before you drop a bomb is, you know, preferred. But, uh, you know, you look outside. You sort of look around outside of the office, you know, outside of the languages we teach, outside of the languages we design, and what do you see? Well, you know, if you take about 20 years of language design, you call the result a little bit, Here's a list of languages that were designed since 91. Uh, you know, they are pretty much all dynamic. They are all without types. They are all, you know, fighting that orthodoxy. You know, they are not static in any way. You can create code, you can manipulate it. There's Java in the middle, but Java is also dynamic. 
It has reflection, it has dynamic code loading. I can generate new code at will. Um, Look at what people do. Here's uh, Adobe Lightroom. Adobe Lightroom is, well, it's 60% uh, of the, oh, 60 of its code base is Lua, right? And then, you know, there's a smattering of Objective C, C, and C++. Why, why do they pick Lua? Because of the ease of, you know, developing, gluing things together. One of the, my favorite examples in this, is, uh, this sequence is, I won't try to pronounce it, the pension system in, in Sweden, which is, which is investing automatically the pension of 5 million people. And this is what? It's 320,000 lines of Perl code. <laughs> now, they care about correctness. Yes, they invented their own contract notation that they add to Perl, and they did lots of things. And they've evaluated the, the, the actual productivity of their programmers. They claim they're just fine. My iPhone. It's Objective-C. Objective-C is what? Well, it's really a dynamic type system for objects on top of a very, very weak type system for uh, the, the core data, right? Look at this. So this is a, there's a company called Redmonk that does some metrics of language popularity. I don't think we should ascribe too much to it, but let's just look at what it says. So this is the popularity in terms of number of projects on GitHub, and this is the popularity of languages in terms of number of questions on Stack Overflow. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, there are metrics, at least quantifiable, and you know, what's the top language? JavaScript. You know, this is the most popular language there is. And there's Java, there's C, C Sharp, C++, and it's all red. Red means dynamic, okay? So this is, these are the language people use. These are the language out there. And so, back to my point. JavaScript programmers hate you because you design languages nobody uses. And I wondered why that was. And I've started working with the uh, R programming language, where, you know, and I started meeting a lot of statisticians, data scientists in biology and chemistry. And I realized there's a fundamental cl clash of worldviews here. Um, in computer science, the object of interest, the thing that matters most is the program. The program is fixed. Data is transient. Data, there's always going to be another input. We don't really truly care about it. In sciences, data is the object of interest. Programs are, there will always be another query. They're just here to give us insight about our data. They are completely uninteresting in and of itself. You know, sometimes they give us good answers, sometimes not. We'll, we'll do it a bunch of times until we're confident. So, in, in some sense, we are designing languages for uh, a problem where, you know, we really care about the program and the program has to be this pristine thing, whereas, uh, which has to be correct. Whereas uh, in sciences, you know, people just want to get the job done. Give me an answer, give me an insight quickly. So what I would claim is languages like ML, Haskell, Scala, and C++ are domain-specific languages. You know, they're just for this niche of programmers that build large systems. And that is a very small part of the, the space of, of users of computational uh, systems. It's a very small uh, part of the, the space of programmers. They're just, you know, the tip of the iceberg. And we spend all of our time focusing on languages like these. Whereas, you know, most people, as you know, the data suggest, don't use those. So instead, you know, a suggestion would be, well, you know, why don't you think about uh, programming languages as a gateway drug, a way to get people into computing? And if you think about that this way, then, you know, don't try to impose disciplines on your users. Don't try to force them into programming the way you think they should program, because what do I know how a biologist should program? How, uh, you know, somebody doing uh, analysis of, 
you know, sort of uh, uh, M, uh, you know, sort of NMR data should 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 structure his computation. I don't know, but if we start by thinking, how can we get them? To, to compute, to work with our tools, and then how to, to help them seems like a better way. So, you know, coming back to this uh, you know, question of typing, which I alluded to earlier. Um, so many people have made claims that static typing has benefits, right? We say, you know, it prevents errors ahead of time. We say that it's easier to generate efficient code on a typed program. Uh, and it provides us with ma a machine check documentation. So if all of these are true, why is it that people keep inventing languages that have no types? And why is it that users keep using those languages? So here's some suggestion, maybe. So one of them is the static type system only catch trivial errors. So back when I was uh, still in Switzerland, I, was, I, I met uh, a lot of the people who were using small talk systems. They were in the banks, uh, UBS, big banks, and they said, you know, we love small talk because it gives us a rapid turnaround. And we, I asked them, well, what about type errors? And they said, yeah, type errors are the easiest to fix. The program is stopped, you know what you expected, your debugger tells you what you got. Simple. It's not hard. Now, there are lots of other errors that are hard to fix. Null pointer error, off by one errors, and one could claim, yes, I can design you a type system to catch those. But the complexity of those you know, increases, and then that means the barrier to entry for people who are not computer scientists increases. Static type systems off ossify your program and hinder evolution of your code. So, a st a type, typing is a global property. Imagine I want to change one function in my program, and I want to test that program with the new function. I have to make the compiler happy globally. I have to change all places that use that function. Say I'm adding an argument. Now I have to go throughout my whole code base, add that argument. It's going to, to slow you down. Uh, Static typing is fundamentally a pessimistic process, right? In case there is a chance your program go wrong, will go wrong, it'll just say no. I mean, often what we would like is an optimistic approach. Just let me run the thing. If it blows up, I'm testing it, I'm developing it, I'll, I'll fix it. Don't tell me what, uh, what, uh, should be the, what, uh, what I should do. Let me do what I want. So, I mean, all of these are just, you know, sort of arguments. There, I have no backing evidence. I have made no science. But the typing, static typing crowd hasn't, ha, doesn't have any science to back their claim either. There's been very little studies of productivity of types, uh, type system. There's one group in Germany which has, you know, mixed results. But here's one, uh, one example of somebody trying to actually ask the question. So, they, what they did in this study was uh, introduce semantic bugs in uh, dynamically and statically typed programs, Ruby and uh, Groovy and Java, and then measure the time students took to fix, um, the, fix the bug. And the hypothesis was a static type system should help you navigate a code base you have never seen, therefore your time to fix a bug should be smaller. Their experiments revealed no difference between, stat no statistically significant difference between the typed and untyped language. We draw, what conclusion should we draw from this? I'm not entirely sure. It is at least somebody who's asking the right question. You know, we're investing a lot of effort intellectually developing type systems, but we don't know whether they're improving productivity. We don't have metrics. We have not asked the question. So, you know, think about this. Uh, in, in statistics, R, the R programming la uh, language, is learned in one lecture. Uh, that's all the time they have to teach a language. Now, we teach Java in, in a year. So, so what's the disconnect? Well, R is simple enough that in one lecture you can start to do useful things. Now, clearly, the people after one lecture don't have a grasp of the semantics, they'll probably make horrible mistakes, but they can start. So the barrier to entry you know, in these dynamic languages is really low. That makes it very easy for people to pick, the, pick up the tools. 
But the goal that here would be, can we find ways to design languages that retain that low barrier to entry, but let us later on put some, uh, you know, put the features we need for large systems design. So, JavaScript programmers hate you. They hate you because you ignore the real world. I'm sure that I, I did that for, for many years. So, um, one thing that often we see is programming language design is just one person's uh, you know, idea how the system should, should work. And you know, that's, you, you'd never, never look at em empirical data about how the language is used. And that causes all sorts of, of imbalances. I'll give you one practical example. So we started looking at JavaScript. And JavaScript uh, has uh, a lot of very dynamic features, which, um, which can cause many difficulties for implementers. Uh, the question that, uh, that people had was, well, how to evaluate the performance of, of, of uh, JavaScript programs? And they came up with a number of benchmark suits. So this is uh, the Sun Spider benchmark suit, which is a standard JavaScript benchmark. And um, what I'm showing here is we, had this we have this tool that looks at the behavior of the JavaScript implementation. And what it's showing us, so the, these are percentages. This is time normalized in bytecode. And this is the activity performed on objects. And the way to read this gr upper graph is as time in the beginning of the program when objects are created, or at object creation, you perform a lot of the red is addition of new fields. The uh, yellow is reads. So you alternate adding field and reading field. Then there's this dotted line, which is the end of object construction. You have uh, an intense period of adding new fields. And then it's all reads. So this is the Sun Spider benchmark behavior. We are adding fields to objects, and then we're reading them. And this is the same, same graph, but for a real website, a real JavaScript program, the Google website. And what it shows is the white part are objects being dead. So what's, what this shows is you know, objects are constructed, they're alive, and very quickly a lot of them die. There is a lot of addition of fields in the beginning and then addition of fields throughout. There is uh, some amount of updates to fields, some amounts of reads. But interestingly, the, the, the purple part here are deletes. So here, fields are being deleted from the object. And it's very strange, because what's happening here is, you'll notice that as I'm constructing the object, I'm also deleting fields. And then, when I finish constructing the object, I really get hog wild and deletes a lot of more fields. So, what's, what should we take from this? Well, the first thing is, is the upper picture going to predict the behavior of real code? So, one of the things that really messes up your optimizations is field deletes. Field deletes means you have to change the structure of the object. Uh, Obviously, up there, there were none. Now, there are some. So the point is, by looking at what people do, you sort of get insights about how people compute. Now, you could say, well, this doesn't matter, right? This is just, so what? Well, here's, so we figured, we were asking ourselves, well, does it matter really in practice? So what we did is we built this tool called JSBench that takes websites and turns them into workloads that can be, uh, that can be repeatedly used as benchmarks. And so what we're showing here is versions of the Firefox engine. We're showing in blue performance speedups due to uh, uh, of the Firefox engine on the Sun Spider benchmark. And it is very, very reasonable, you know, 49 times faster. This is a good speed up. This is a speed up you can go and write a PLDI paper or two about. And mostly what it, com what, what it comes from is the tracing JIT, when it encounters program that has very regular loops, those, does very well at generating efficient code. 
Now, the red line is the speed up over all versions of Firefox on uh, the Google website. 4x. Why? Because there is none of the regularity you see in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the fake benchmarks in real code. Therefore, the tracing JIT completely fails to help. And you see that there is not at all that big jump of performance. Yeah. Well, but it's over 1.5 to 6, but yes. You can write a PLDI paper with a 5% speed up. <laughs> um, so, so this matters, right? I mean, if we don't look at what the real world does, well, you end up spending a lot of your engineering time or, 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 or uh, brain power solving problems that are not really helping. So, yeah? No, this is just throughput. Okay. So this is just throughput. Yeah. Um, as a, as a, well, I'll leave that for later. So, so, so then, the other thing that dynamic languages have, which most others don't, is reflection. And so, what is reflection is the ability to look at the program as it's running and change its da data or code you know, uh, programmatically. And that completely blows away any hope of static analysis, right? Because as soon as you see one reflective operation, potentially the whole world has changed. Because you, it takes a string that, come, 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 that could come from the user input and does whatever the string told it to do. <laughs> so, well, again, good question is, well, what do people do with reflection? So, yeah. <laughs> well, the title, uh, yes. Anyway, um, so 100% of the top 100 websites use JavaScript. 82% of them use Eval. Eval is the way to do reflection in JavaScript. And I'll just give you the high level bits. So the size of strings uh, is about 8 bytes, the mean. So small strings. The biggest reflect strings sent to reflection in uh, actually 10,000 pages we looked at was 500 kilobytes. So now try to guess what the 500 kilobytes of text will do ahead of time, hard. So the number of calls, most well-written programs have less than 100. The worst one had 100,000 calls. You know, so pretty much everything that was going on was a reflective call. The number of sites of invocation of reflection, most well program will have less than 10. The worst had 1,300. So imagine trying to figure out that and validate 1,300 reflective call. It's probably not going to work out too well. So then we looked at, well, what do people do with reflection? Oh, that's a good question. Well, the, the reason we started this was we were asking ourselves, can we get rid of it in this new language called Thorn that we were designing? So in JavaScript, by far the most use of, of, of reflection is for JSON. JSON is a serialization format which takes a string and transforms it into objects or takes objects and transforms them into strings. So it's just a communication format. Nowadays, there are better ways to do this, so we should be able to get rid of all the JSON. And then we saw a number of patterns that were occurring a lot, like just simple read. You know, the, the only thing the reflection thing uh, call was doing was reading the field of an object or a simple assign. And then there were weird patterns, like testing that the type of an object was undefined. My, my favorite one is this one, which says what? Assign 14 to variable v, throw the exception 14, catch this exception, discard it. <laughs> For the life of me, I don't know what it does. I'm, I'm, uh, and we saw this, uh, so, so this, uh, this was you know, like uh, one or two percent of the cases, so enough that you would notice. Sorry? Uh, so we did, actually, and I don't think we got an answer for that one. We got an answer for some of the others, but that one remains a mystery. Pro yeah. Probably an art, well, I don't know. Another thing we noticed is, at a particular call site, the kind of thing you do remains the same. So if you have a call site of Eval that reads a field, 
a lot of the time, most of the time, it we will it'll do the same. So the thought we had was, well, okay, we can't do anything statically, but what if at runtime we learned from the string you pass to eval and try to you know, infer a grammar from these. If they're doing the same thing, just changing the names, we could write a recognizer that would, instead of running the full power of eval, would uh, just do the one thing that you're supposed to do at that website, at that call site, and if you get a string that doesn't match, just reject it. So we did that, and we wrote a tool that generates replacement patterns, takes reflection, runs the program, and then replaces the pattern with code that doesn't call reflection. And we found that with three strings, we're 95% accurate. So if you give us three strings, that, uh, three calls to reflection, we can tell you what you will do 95% of the time. So that's sort of... Um, uh, you know, encouraging. It means that a lot of the reflection is really used for very mundane and silly things. They're just, you know, things that the programmer didn't bother to encode in another way. All right. So, JavaScript programmer hate you because you solve irrelevant problems. And, you know, so you mentioned uh, ownership types. Uh, I'll pick first on alias analysis for Java. So if you type into Google, this is my way of doing research, I type into Google alias analysis Java, I get 13,000 hits, 13,000 PDF files, so a filter for PDF. So there's 13,000 papers that talk about alias analysis of Java in one way or another. Now, how many production Java virtual machine use any form of alias analysis? Do you know any? Well, if you define it in any interesting way, the answer is zero. That I know of. Uh, and why? Well, because all alias analysis for Java are unsound or useless. Take your pick. They're either unsound because they're ignoring reflection and uh, native call, or they're useless because they're not ignoring reflection and native calls, and then you know, every time you see one, you have to say, I don't know. Uh, Ownership types. So I worked a little bit at the beginning of ownership types, and I was really, really happy because we almost got ownership, a variant of ownership types integrated in the safety-critical Java specification. It was a very dumbed-down, simplified variant. It was the best I could get. And I stopped going to the meetings. What do I know now? It's been moved to an appendix. It's become an optional. And I'm sure by the time the standard gets released, it'll be gone. So that was the, my closest, closest, you know, sort of thing at a success story for ownership type. Information flow security. Does anybody uh, do information flow security? I don't want to insult anyone. Yes, then you know. Um, <laughs> so. Uh, a better metric, a much better metric for productivity that it would be, you know, time to solution. And that's, that's at, at, at the end, that's what we should be thinking about. You know, it's not, uh, you sh we should be evaluating languages, tools, as how long d does it decrease time to solution from the point somebody gets a problem to the point he gets correct code. And there, um, um, dy uh, dynamic languages do something that is sort of controversial. You know, they are failure oblivious. So by that, what I mean is dynamic languages do their best to keep their program running even if they know it's wrong. Okay? And they do that by a number of ways. First thing is, they will let you run a program that is incomplete, that is patently incomplete. There's, you know, the, the data types that are not defined, functions that are not defined. The, the language won't care. It says, you want to run this? Sure, I'll run this for you. And if you fall off a cliff, I'll tell you you fell off a cliff. Now, the advantage of that is you can test a program before you have filled in all those things, as long as you don't need those parts. They will convert data types automatically. So you're expecting a date, you get a string. Well, uh, R will say, let's see if I could parse that as a string. No, maybe it wasn't, but you know, I'll, 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 I'll give you a string. And they swallow errors. So whenever there's an error, you know, you have, uh, all the language will try to ignore it. So they're, in some sense, their best effort, optimistic execution engines, right? So here's an example. So in JavaScript, if I create an object, it's empty. 
you know, this is the empty object, nothing in it, and I bind it to X. Then I say, assign 42 to the B field of X. Now, X doesn't have a B field. What does JavaScript do? It says, well, obviously, you want it to have a B field. I will give it a B field, you know, initialize it, then store 42 in it. Makes sense. Uh, what else? Then you say, read the F field using reflection. So this is a string. I'm using it to access the F field of X. You know, potentially that string came from user input, so you would not know that it's, it's wrong. And X, of course, doesn't have an X field. So what happens? Well, we return the undefined value. My best get as uh, what, what you should get. And no errors now. Now, I take Y, which is bound to undefined, and I try to access F. Here is the point where I get an error, because here you're trying to access the field of something undefined, and even JavaScript says, all right, I'll give up. <laughs> you know, there's, you know, poof, and throws an exception. So what we did as an experiment, so we were working on, on some security project, and we had this, uh, this tool that could impose security policies on the ads that are running in a website. So you take New York Times, it has a bunch of ads. So we would impose security policies on those ads, security policies that are arbitrary, for which the ads weren't designed. So in some sense, we were uh, arbitrarily preventing the ads from doing things. And we had a bunch of policies and 50 real world, world, website, real li uh, world websites. And the interesting part of this experiment was how the website continued or didn't continue to work when random parts of its code would just blow up. And essentially out of the, so here I'm showing two policies, not going to say what they do, and there was only one website that completely break, broke. All the other kept kind of working, either, either completely working, either we were just an ad blocker, or they would maybe have fewer menus, some, some things like that. But the point I'm making here is this means that you can have programs that break that continue to have a useful value. So this is back to this morning discussion about usefulness and economy. It is much better to have the New York Times, I mean, one could argue that it is better to have the New York Times webpage work with maybe a menu that is not showing up than not work. And I'm convinced that if I had written the same code in Java, this website in Java, there would be exception that would not be caught, and the sites would probably break completely. Um, so another thing, another beef that you'll hear from the JavaScript crowd is, well, you know, you just prove theorems because you can, OK? Um, so here's an, uh, I'll give you one example. So this is work on gradual typing. So, the idea of gradual typing is that you come up with a language that is dynamic and you want to add st uh, static types to it. Or you come up with a static language and you want to add dynamic types to it. And you want them to somehow interoperate nicely. So you want to, you know, to have a static part, a dynamic part, and be able to uh, you know, go from one to the other. And there were a bunch of designs that were published, and th these designs had a very different uh, philosophical approach to how to, to integrate these things. So I'll just give you a little bit of a, a, an example to set it up. So imagine I have a language that has an ID function. And the ID function, this is an untyped part of my language. The ID takes an argument x and returns it. It's not an exciting function, but it's a function. And then I have somewhere some code, right, some code. So here is. Uh, a call to the ID that takes an array of strings, say, in this imaginary language, binds it to X, then re extracts the first uh, element of that array, and appends uh, uh, a letter to it. So this is going to run fine in a dynamic language, because this is an array of strings. This extracts an element, and it concatenates. And even, and most likely, even if it was an array of string, the language would probably convert one or the other to, uh, to some uh, same representation. OK. So in a gradual typing language, the thought is what you want to do is be able to add type annotations. So here, imagine that uh, somebody 
looks at that function and maybe he's using it in some context. Well, no, that's not. Uh, he's using it some context where he always uses it with an argument that is an array of int. So he says, let me add this uh, int array as a, a, a tag. So in a gradual typing context, I can call this from untyped land. So for instance, assume that this is an untyped call. So this is uh, a call where for some reason we don't know the type of this. What will happen in uh, a lot of proposals is that this value will be wrapped with a cast that will remember the promised type array of int and just propagate the value with that cast. And then when we try to use it at a type that is incorrect, so here we're trying to extract a value that's still fine, and here we're trying to add something that should be an int but is actually a string to a string. And there we will get a, a cast error. And the argument we're making is that, um, and, and the, the reason why they did this is that this, this design allows them to have prove a very nice theorem. And the theorem is this. If you have a, a, a gradually typed program, if there is a type error, it always comes from the dynamic part of the program. It's a very nice theorem. It works very well. Now, the reason why I think this is a bad design is imagine that this bit of code was well tested. Imagine that this bit of code was well tested, widely used, deployed. Now, suddenly adding this type annotation breaks well tested code. And the other thing is adding this type annotation in those implementation also to adds runtime overhead because now we have to pack that value with a type cast and move that around. So what we let me so what we proposed was another solution, which was to say we'll have something else, uh, this idea of like type. And for us, a like type was uh, an annotation that made no guarantees to clients of the code. You could always send anything into it, but only gave you, um, gave you local type checking assistance. So essentially, what that was saying is, make sure you type check the body of this function, here is trivial x, as if x is an integer array. And the, the interesting difference is, in our, in our design, this program runs fine because we have no guarantee on client code. And the argument we were making is that, you know, with this, we're more faithful to the dynamic nature of things because adding type annotation only slows, uh, speeds up the program. It never breaks a running system that has been well tested, and the type system is always on. Interestingly, the same approach is being tried now. So Torn died, but uh, the same approach is being tried now both by Facebook with their PHP uh, type system and by Clojure. Same principles. So um, one thing that we don't like to admit is, you know, at the end of the day, often programming language doesn't matter as much as we would like it to, right? Uh, Facebook uses PHP and has millions of, of lines of PHP, and they're, you know, they're doing okay. This, this pension system written in Perl, people just pick the tool that works and they can make pretty much anything work. So here's an example of making anything work. So I've been working with R, and the R programming language is really interesting because um, it is... Uh, probably the most widely used lazy functional language out there. Nobody knows that. Nobody knows that it's lazy and functional because it has an assignment statement. But it's also probably the weirdest language that I've seen, and I've seen a few. So just to show you how people work with insanity. So these are the se semantic rules for variable lookup in R. Actually, don't, don't strain your eyes if you're in the back, I'll walk you through it. These are only the part of the semantic rules for variable lookup that deal with looking up the x variable when x is in a function call, a function position in a function call. Okay, so there are two cases in R. So there's one case where if x is bound 
to a, a value, I can, I, can, I can essentially try to run x, hoping that it's bound to a function. That's not guaranteed, but you know, it will stop if it does, isn't. Since, uh, uh, since, uh, since uh, uh, r is lazy, uh, x could also be bound to what they call a promise, in which case I have to push the promise on the stack, evaluate the promise, then get the, the promise value out, plop it back into x, and try to, uh, try to, um, try to, to run that. And then there's all this mess of rules for looking up things. And here's, here's what these rules are doing. I'm going to skip those and just give you the example, which is pretty fun. So these rules are really doing, so, so see this thing above, I have a call to, to the function c in R, this is the function that creates a vector, and I have another program that takes c, binds it to d, and calls d. So in most languages, these two things should be, uh, if you have high, higher order functions that you can bind to variables, these should be equivalent, right? You know, I'm calling C or I'm setting it, putting it in a local variable and then calling it through the local variable. In R, they're not. Why? Well, the function lookup in R works like this. If I'm in the context of calling a function, I will do a lexically scoped lookup, find the first occurrence of C, check that it is bound to a function, if it is bound to a function, fine, I run it. If it is not bound to a function, I skip that definition of C, keep on looking in my environment until I get to a definition of C. Now, uh, in this example, uh, in this, uh, on this side, there's always a, a, a ver version of C defined in the environment because it's top level. In here, um, uh, not necessarily. So what's going on? So in here, what happens is maybe the first C I get is a local variable, and uh, you know, and 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 then I I, I have not a function but uh, some some value. So why why did they do that? Uh, oh, one thing to add is since R is lazy, the process of looking up a name may cause side effects. It may cause evaluation because you don't know if something is bound to a function. It's bound to a promise. You have to evaluate the promise. Then you can tell if it's bound to a function. So we run 3.4 million lines of R code. We looked at how many times does this rule kick in. It kicks in very little for two symbols, only two symbols. C, which I used in my example conveniently, because C is the one thing you have to do in R. It's the only way to construct a data structure. And it's also a handy variable name once A and B are used. And file, because file is the name of the function that opens a file, and it's usually the name you assign the thing to. For these two things, they have this horrible, horrible, horrible construction. So, well, what, are, what to, to take of this? Well, first, people live with it. You know, this is, semantically, this is disgusting, right? Name lookup is different whether you're in a context of a function call or a variable lookup. It may have side effects, it may cause computation. This is, this, is, this is disgusting. People will live with it, they're, they're fine. And you know, the other uh, observation is, if they had looked at how people use this, they could just have made these two names reserved and be done with it. You would have a much simpler interpreter, you know, fewer surprises. All right, so to conclude. Conclude? Uh, I think, you know, I'm not arguing that what we're doing is useless, you know. I'm not. I think what you, we are doing is very, very important, otherwise I wouldn't be doing this, right? Uh, what I'm arguing is we should look at how, you know, the techniques we design actually impact real people out there. You know, the value system should be, you know, look at real users. And how can you actually change the way they work? Um, I'm arguing that you know, we should look at real world usage, really you know, do studies of uh, you know, what features are used, how they're used, then feed that back in, in, in our designs. And finally, I'm arguing we should embrace the dynamism of these languages. You know, the dynamism is there to stay. You know, we can't 
keep. So the way I, I think of it is, you know, in our community, we want to turn everything into Pascal, right? We like Pascal. It was a fine language. So let's turn all the language we work on into Pascal. No, no, very simple, no reflection, nothing. That's not going to come back, you know. Unfortunately, all the language out there are Lisp. And so we should just deal with that, right? They're reflective, they're hard, you know, hard to pin down. But, you know, we can, right? Maybe we can start pushing things into the runtime rather than doing static analysis ahead of time. You know, start pushing your analysis into the runtime system. Put, uh, you know, have analysis that can fail. Say, well, this analysis is predicated on some fact. If something that the program does invalidates one of those facts, I can invalidate my analysis. So, you know, so there, are, there are things. I mean, all I'm saying is, you know, there's a plenty of interesting languages out there: R, JavaScript, PHP. We should be helping those folks, right? They need it more. That's where we can have most impact. Thank you. Speed is not as important as we make it out to be. 
but it is all, it, it is you know somewhere it is going to hit you that's the thing right so for instance with r most people are fine with the fact that they're using a language that is 400 times slower than c but there's this you know 10% of your user base that wants to run big data and they're 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 stuck because suddenly they have developed all of this in r it was working very well and now they're seeing that they, they can't compute in a week so what do they do well, they record it in C or something, but it's very, very painful. Yeah. I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to just make a, more a statement than a question. And it relates kind of to what Moshi said before. Like the people aspect is not just the users, but it's also um, the large software, also large websites and stuff. It's, it's usually happening in a team and um, it works both ways, right? So when you're developing with the team, then um, it can help you to have classes and static checking and everything just because the names are discoverable. So it's a very mundane and trivial aspect, but it's a very important one because suddenly new people can come into your team and they immediately see what methods to call and, and everything is very established. Now I have heard likewise, just to qualify it, I have heard of teams who are uh, very comfortable in dynamic languages and will compensate with unit tests any tests, any breakages that they will incur. And that's fine too, because then they have some established some communication that everybody just shares uh, this, this common knowledge of what method names exist and how a method should be called and in which order the parameters should come. So um, I think I would take this, this lesson also to the development process, which I don't really see, you know, us uh, tailoring tools to, to, to sort of you know make make teams more productive. It's always about the one omniscient programmer who gets like gigantic tools, but but maybe he will build up some crazy type expression which he understands, but then he cannot share across across the, the team to other people. So to add an anecdote to this, the reason or the way so so Facebook is moving from PHP to a typed version of PHP. And the, the selling thing, the, the, the only thing that sold the developer to it was that with the type system, they would get name completion. <laughs> That's silly, right? But no, this is actually <laughs> what <laughs> sold it. The right? advantage of OO is the auto completion that you don't have in but, but with types, right? With types, I mean, without the types, yeah. they, they, they were doing guesses, you know, they were just looking at random keys. No. Yeah. So it, so let me ask a final question. So on one of your earlier slides, you had a bullet which you didn't talk about, which said you should just design things as carefully as Apple designed the iPhone. Yes. Now they make a point that they don't listen to their users, right? You promise them <laughs> what people they, want. They and don't so listen to their users? And so my question is, I mean, maybe it's also our job to tell the our users that they shouldn't use this crap and nobody has an idea <laughs> how much data analysis out there okay. is transplantedly wrong because people got their R programs wrong. It's perfectly fine. Let, let's let's become on, on Bertrand since he's not here, right? So the the reason why uh, you know I have an iPhone is that somehow they managed to convince me I wanted one. I don't program on in Eiffel every day because he hasn't made the same argument. So yes, yes, sure. I mean we should be able to tell them what they should do, but we should be convincing. So you know, if we can't convince them, that's that's just failure, right? So it's either because we're wrong, which is possible. You know, we are just saying that this is the way you should program, but it's not the way. You know, for a for users that have no grasp of computer science, to start telling them what is a type error is meaningless, right? I mean, they they're much better off just interacting with the system, uh, or it is we're not doing a good enough sales job. I don't know. Now they're doing a pretty good one. Okay, thank you very right. much. Thank you.